Hello, my name is Matt Morris. Um, I'd first like to say I'm really glad that I'm in the small room. <laughs> um, for me, this whole trip has been a lot about self exploration and change a lot. And that would start with the fact that I now have four piercings, <laughs> I put my hair in a man bun, <laughs> and it's blonde. Um, but on top of the outside, I also really regained a passion for learning. And um, before this trip, I would say in high school, I found two classes to be interesting. They were geography and creative writing. Um, outside of that, I kind of just wanted the grades, and I wasn't really concerned with actually learning stuff or finding what I was really passionate about. Um, but it kind of makes sense that I'm here with the geography class, loving that. And then creative writing really inspired me because that's where I discovered that I really like to write poetry, and I really liked coming at things in a new and abstract way. And so what I wanted to do for my presentation of learning was see how I could use poetry to positively affect change. And so it's a pretty abstract poem that is based on a few um, kind of extreme experiences from the trip that really impacted me. And yeah. Uh, I'm just going to read the poem and then open it up for questions. You guys are more than welcome to ask clarifying anything you want. So it's called The Awakening. I venture into the forest because I love it. It whispers, rustles, and invites me to drink with it, filling my glass to the brim. In the woods, I can escape. I can be alone and free but still surrounded. There's a certain oneness in it, a, full, or a fullness of shared existence and mutual dependence. I am real. I am alive. I implore the trees to assist me on the path to clarity, so often a difficult road to travel. Abstract experiences guide my footsteps until I arrive at a sober swamp, home to grasses that reach higher than the human ego, and fallen trees that crash where they please, and stayed there. For the only proper burial is the earth from which they sprung forth, and from which their ancestors will spring forth again. I hear leaves crunching and a distant owl hooting as I wander towards the shiny water. I peer into it, and while ripples distort the reflection, I see a multidimensional face shaped by memory, with, with eyes wide open. Long ago, I watched three peculiar men, wearing ragged clothing and unkept hair. They carried chainsaws across a filthy, muddy landscape. Rain poured from the heavens. I surveyed with an inexplainable entitlement, the days. The three beings ventured into nature, and then I heard the sound of power slicing through beauty. What was curious was that as they cut deeper and deeper into the veins of the forest, Mother Nature fought back, hurling frozen stones down upon them. And I sat idly under an umbrella called privilege, ignorant and unaware. The trees whispered as they always do, wake up. And the humans react as they always do, silence. We've been cultured to ignore everything. And when your dream is ignorance, the hardest part is waking up. It's a funny thing how people change. So often, it's not to better themselves or the world. People change to conform to unreasonable standards of beauty, wealth, and perfection. Six impossibly thin glass bodies crushed to pieces, now only held together by layers of cover-up, bloody red lip gloss, and bright yellow bikinis. Each wears a luminescent smile, because when outside appearance is everything, nothing else matters. It's all the viewer can see. Each is the queen bee of society, worshipped and sought after. Masked beneath the visible is a constant fear of imperfection and rejection in the eyes of another. They compete for those who don't see humans anymore, but objects. Maybe it's not just the world that's objectified them. 
but also themselves. A crowd a thousand strong, dazed, drunk, and confused. Dancing intensified, and as more and more skin was revealed. But the perfect smiles continued to sustain the lie. I sat under a charcoal sky, waiting for the tears to come. But sometimes they don't, especially when we need them, or most need them to. I peered out at a cold and desolate lake. It seemed altogether dead, devoid of life. A ladybug rested on her back on the surface, legs in the air, flailing, drowning under the weight of the beehive. The hive destroyed her, leaving her for dead, like broken glass cast out beyond hope of repair. It wasn't the first time the hive tried to drown her, and I knew it wouldn't be the last. Broken, self-blaming, then putting the, back, the pieces back together, only to be broken again. There's a certain power dynamic between the drowners and the drowning, cloaked so well in a mask of innocence, so fully ingrained in the media, in relationships, even in education, that the drowners and the drowning alike accept and embrace it. It continues because we're blind. It, be, it continues because we're asleep. And yet, the beehive is afraid, because even a small, spotted, spotted bloody orange creature, in all its miniature malevolence, once awakened, once empowered, can start a ripple effect. Eight ladybugs swam out and carried their sister to shore, not out of pity, but because her, her courage inspired them, and it inspired me. Sometimes when broken, we need others to glue us back together. Courageous defiance began to dismantle the system. The ladybug broke the cycle. Sharing stories created power, and the dynamic began to shift. She's strong, powerful, passionate, and awake. The stars tell her story. Look up and see. The river of life is as unpredictable as it is magical. I heard about a brightly colored sunflower, as fragile and impermanent as we all are. It was one in a million in a sea of yellow. Every morning the sun would rise just for it. It shone bright, illuminating everyone who saw it. But then, one night it drooped, and the yellow faded to gray, and the glow became memory. I couldn't understand why, why the best suffer the most, why the world never notices. The next morning, the sun still rose, but the small circle around the flower, around the once dazzling flower, drooped a little bit more, defeated by the absolute unfairness of life, with drips of morning dew falling like tears from their sunken petals. I laid on the water, peering up at the blanket of darkness above me. I noticed a cluster of stars I'd spotted during each step of my voyage from every vantage point around the globe, guiding and inspiring the odyssey should we choose to look. The night sky unifies us. Waves with white foaming tips poured over me. I gasped and I fought as the freezing water washed me away. Each mound affected me a little differently. Some caressed me in a way I can't ever put into words. They come and they pass, only lasting a brief moment in the grand river of life. And then they're gone, fading depictions of memory, each having left a distinct, distinct impression on my body. Moments are gone in an instant, so I suggest we keep our eyes open. Why write a poem? Why not something else? I think for me it was because I discovered both before the trip and during the trip that I really loved poetry. And I found it as an extremely effective method of self-reflection, something I could do when 
I really needed to be alone, but get my feelings out, get my thoughts out. It was something that I was able to turn to in a lot of situations. And since this poem was in large part kind of about self-reflection, me personally waking up, it made a lot of sense to use a medium which I'd used in order to reflect. It's a beautiful poem about awakening. And I wonder, was it one particular episode or event that happened during the year that made you realize, oh my God, I really am waking, waking up? Or was it more a gradual series of events that touched you? I think it was really a series of events with a couple monumental moments. So, as you may have picked up, a major theme of the poem was sexism. And what I was referring to with the six glass bodies was a beauty pageant that I watched in Ecuador. And the experience just made me extremely uncomfortable. And um, I think it was during that that I really had a moment of, like, like, wow, like, you know, this is real. And that sounds weird, but it's also like, it's so easy to just look past things when they don't really personally affect you or you don't really have personal experience with them. And I think that was kind of what I had going on before TVB. Like, I would say I was sympathetic to the cause of feminism, for example, or, you know, stuff like that. Or like, I cared about the environment. But it's when you really have a personal experience that really draws you into it is when you really wake up. Did you notice the difference in the way the women were treated in the different homes you stayed in? Compared to? Each other. OK. Um, so I would say. Definitely country to country it varied, but I think Ecuador was really where it hit home for me. It was kind of like looking back and I was like, oh yeah, in South Africa, in India. I think a lot of people would say that India was the most um, kind of repressive towards women of the three countries we visited. But for me, I guess I woke up in, woke up in Ecuador. Um, I think Something I noticed in Ecuador was not in my particular family, but in a family a couple of houses down. There was host sister, two host sisters of girls in our group who one was 16 and one was 20, and they had like a two year old child and a six year old child or something, respectively. So that was really inspiring, or not inspiring, obviously, but eye opening for me. And the fathers were gone, didn't know who they were. Um, I think single mothers were a common theme throughout for people in the trip. That was, for me, only in um, South Africa, but I think a lot of people had a lot of single mothers raising children on their own and things like that. Does that answer your question? No? I don't know. I kind of beat around it. <laughs> yes. um, you talked about this poem being inspired by a couple of monumental events for you, one of those yes. being in Ecuador. I'd love to hear maybe another kind of moment that lies at the foundation of this poem. Um, sh sure. Uh, I think, I guess some of these are like pretty personal to both myself and in the group, but I would say like the poem not about is not fully just about sexism or anything. Um, another example is someone in the group lost someone really dear to them from back home, and so there was a line or there was a section, the sunflower part, which was kind of a tribute to that and how that really affected me. Kind of the way this poem came together was just what experiences affected me the most, and yeah, so that's, there's a few other examples, some more some private or personal than others, I guess. Yeah? 
So there's a lot of images in the poem. And mm -hmm. I'm just kind of curious. I'm more process interested. So are these images that you saw and you thought, oh, this represents this that I've been feeling and thinking? Or is it that you reflected back on past things, you know, like the beehive? You know, is that, is it, does the image come first and then the, the reflection on what it, what it means for you and what it aligns with, or is it the other way around? Um, I think in a lot of ways it depends. Like for me, when I was writing this, um, I was sitting by a lake and, or one time I was writing it, and I saw a ladybug struggling on the surface of the water. And so it made its way into my phone. The beehive, I wanted a metaphor for society that didn't just say society. And so once I linked the women at the beauty pageant to the queen bees of society, then it was like, okay, now let's go with society as a beehive. So it kind of depended. Yes. I'm just wondering, there's a part where you talk about ignorance. I'm waking up yes. from that. And I just wonder if you could read that question. Oh, yeah. At the beginning? I think it was near the beginning. Okay. You can't find it, so I can ask you afterwards. Um, I just want to make sure I know what you're talking about. It's the, the part where, okay, yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. Long ago, I watched three peculiar men wearing ragged clothing and unkept hair. They carried chainsaws across a filthy, muddy landscape. Rain poured from the heavens. I surveyed with an inexplicable entitlement, a daze. The three beings ventured into nature, and then I heard the sound of power slicing through beauty. What was curious was that as they cut deeper and deeper into the veins of the forest, Mother Nature fought back curling frozen stones down upon them. And I sat idly under an umbrella called privilege, ignorant and unaware. So that's kind just, of like... Yeah, I just really, I think that, that, that was a really powerful part for me. Yeah. I like the, the wording of power slicing through beauty. And um, I think it goes, you went on a little farther about the waking up. Oh yeah, yeah. I can read that part if you like. The trees whispered as they always do, wake up and the humans reacted as they always do. Silence. We've been cultured to ignore everything. And when your dream is ignorance, the hardest part is waking. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, we, we South America is kind of famous for beauty pageants and phenomenal amounts of plastic surgery and so on. As you and your group are down there and you're having these revelations, for example, you're being at that beauty pageant scene, just like looking. I'm wondering what kind of effect you feel you might have on the people you met down there, the other guys, the other men, villagers, because they might be used to seeing things a certain way, and you come in with a different perspective. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think a big thing is kind of waking people up, and I don't, I don't know how well relief I personally did that. I think a lot of other people had conversations with certain people if they were saying things or doing things that kind of crossed the line. Um, I think for me, a big thing I realized is that I'm not a confrontational person. I'm afraid of that. I need to take the next step after you've waken up and actually do something about it and so I don't know I think what I've kind of come to the conclusion of and realized is that the issue isn't just at all in any part of the world it's everywhere and it is super deeply ingrained in American culture so well sometimes that you will not notice it if you cannot notice it your entire life if you don't look for it. Because it's so normal and it's so accepted. Um, I think it just means like standing up for people when you see an uncomfortable situation, for example, going forth in the future, I mean, or having conversations, you know, that open people's eyes because a lot of the time people don't want to be 
it's not like people want to do things that make other people feel terrible about themselves or no one wants to hurt others but sometimes but i think the biggest issue is, is ignorance people don't know what the implications of their actions are conversations or standing up in situations where you see something going on is a good way for me to go forward I really appreciated what you were saying with I cared about the environment and then it took that personal moment to really care about the environment in a different way. There's like a very profound subtlety in what I think it can mean to wake up. So I really appreciated that comment. I guess my question then is questions of yourself moving into the next. Um, yeah, like where is the next big experience going to come from? Where am I going to, like, how do I find a new, how do I wake up again? Like, I think for me, in many ways, my eyes were open to the detrimental environmental impacts that humans are causing, or creating, whatever. But at the same time, sexism was the biggest thing for me. And so there's a plethora of other issues still out there that I really need to like wake up on fully, you know? It's like, I can, I don't know, there's a lot of things where I'm still kind of just, I, not fully aware and like I really think it does take a personal experience to really connect to it and so I think going forth it's finding ways to put myself in uncomfortable situations see how other people live and the hardships that people face and kind of really embracing that taking it on and not just sympathizing with it but really fully Word right now, but <laughs> like taking a part of it and yeah. Yes. Do you write a poem um, to write something beautiful? And you certainly succeeded in that, but or do you write a poem to change things? In, the, in which case you might argue that you should use less abstract, less difficult to grasp things. So what drives you? I think I've never tried to do this before where I actually wanted to speak to an audience in, through a poem and make a difference. And I think I've always really, really loved using flowery language and abstract examples. And I think that is really what poetry is for me. And I think a lot of it also is letting people interpret it how they want to. And even like for this, this is much more cut and dry than I would normally write. I would usually make it such that one person reads it and then someone else reads it and gets a totally different perspective from it or an idea from it. And I think that's really cool is that you can create this piece of art that is really multidimensional and can be interpreted in many different ways. And so I think as far as creating social change and doing something like that, I think I can still do that and maybe it's even more powerful through this means as opposed to making it so cut and dry because I feel like making it a little more abstract makes it poetry and kind of makes it art and then makes it, I think people really connect and relate to art. Where is your next step? Where are you going? school and has it will it influence what your major is going to be or has it changed your mind about the outcome? Um before this trip I had no idea what I wanted to study and like until maybe a week ago I had no idea either. <laughs> now I kind of feel like I want to learn more about like sociology I guess how people react to things, how people I think I was throwing this idea of conformity versus individualism in this poem. I think that's really interesting to me how people tend to just do what's normal, why well, that's so much more comfortable and so much easier to do than stepping out and being different. And so, yeah, maybe psychology, maybe, uh, I don't know. But <laughs> I have a, like a better idea now. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm going to Montana State next year, and yeah, I don't know. It's just like a big state school, so there'll be programs out there. I think I was much more excited about it a year ago going there. I blew every to go skiing, be <laughs> outside all the time, and that's still awesome because I think nature is a huge part of my life, and I love that. But uh, I don't know how much. I kind of am more interested to see where I can most make a difference as opposed to where I would most just feel comfortable. You know? So kind of stepping out of the comfort zone. So. Mm -hmm. You mentioned guiding stars in your home. <coughs> and I was wondering do you think those will continue to guide you going forward, or are they specific to this experience? Really, what happened with that was they were just like a comfort to me. And I thought there's something like it's unifying. It wasn't really, I kind of just like added in the guiding part. I first saw this small cluster of stars in Jeromsla, India. And then we moved to Delhi, India. I was like, oh my gosh, you can still see them. You know, <laughs> 600 miles apart. Then we went to Cambodia and I spotted them again and I was like, okay, cool. And then we went halfway around the world to Ecuador and I was like, okay, like they're still there. And it's kind of like they were just, I don't know, it was something for me that I always thought was really cool. It's kind of like a unifying part of humanity where the world's really different, I guess, but. Anywhere in the world, you can look up at the same night sky and see, or maybe not, it could just be Northern Hemisphere, I don't know. But, <laughs> or Northern Hemisphere, well, it's on the I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But it's cool, it's kind of unifying to see how everywhere in the world you can kind of just see the same thing. We're all unified by that. It's a connection to others. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what it was. Not here in the <laughs> <laughs> so we've got time for one more question. How do we get a copy of your book? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> put it on my website. No. Uh, sell it. Yeah. <laughs> you can watch my video, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or no, maybe I'll put it up on my blog or something, which I haven't updated since. <laughs> <laughs> There'd be a lot of other things I need to update. But, <laughs> yeah, maybe that's a good thing I could do. <laughs>